Bear Valley. We're so glad you're here. Let's all stand and worship together. There is a light that burns in the darkness. There is a hope that washes the fear away. There is a peace that settles around us. It is your love that sets our hearts ablaze. joining us this morning. What a great way to get our 
our service started, asking God to come fill this place with his spirit. Y'all go ahead and have a seat, and let's watch this together. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship at Bear Valley Church. My name's Kyle, I'm the youth pastor here, and whether you're joining us in person or online, we are so glad to be sharing our Sunday morning with you. I wanna let you know about a couple of things as our service gets started. If you're here with us in person, take out the bulletin that was on your seat when you came in, open it up and take a look inside. One of the things you'll see in your bulletin is this communication card. We would love for you to fill this card out now uh, and you can drop it in the collection area on your way out the door. If you're joining us online, you can fill out this same card at bearvalleychurch.com connect. We would love to connect with you today, uh, to know that you're tuning in or joining us here in person. We would love to pray for you this week and on the back you can share prayer requests on this card. Thanks for filling it out. Also in your bulletin, you'll see some announcements about upcoming events. We do finally have some things coming up in the life of our church, so be sure to check those out and we'll hear more about what's coming up at the end of the service. So stick around after the message for that. That's all we've got for right now. Let's continue in worship. So uh, a whole bunch of years ago when I was a young mom, I learned something that changed the way that I viewed faith and the way that I viewed God. I learned that uh, God was for me, <laughs> that he was in my corner, that he was in my camp, that he was on my side. And I know that sounds crazy to think that he wouldn't have been but I spent a lot of years trying desperately to please him, feeling like I was always falling short. And I remember when I started to understand that God loved me and was for me and was in my corner, it changed the whole way I viewed him. Instead of feeling like I always had to perform and impress, I stopped feeling like that and started feeling like he was with me in my struggle. And so we're going to sing a song called Run to the Father where it talks a lot about how we all have burdens that we carry and uh, oftentimes we feel like it's just ours to carry and we have to carry it all by ourselves but that's not who God is that's not what faith is God intends for you to go to him with your burdens so that he can help you in them you're never meant to carry it on your own we were never meant to carry it on our own so this morning I want to encourage us all to um, think about those burdens and uh, let's let's try to release them Let's lay them down at his feet and ask for his help.
we come this morning and we pray that to all these burdens that we're carrying that are so so heavy and I know that every person in this room carries a burden that most people would know nothing about we carry them alone we feel like we we have to we feel like it's our duty to carry these burdens all by ourselves God I pray this morning that we would release that to you that we would no longer try to do all of it on our own even though sometimes we feel like we're supposed to but that we would let you in, that we would let you help, that we would let you guide us to the right direction to go, the right thing to do. Help us with our burdens today, God. And we thank you that you are a loving God that would want to. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its stories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good the desire, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, health to the soul, and a river of pleasure. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Pray it in, read it through, live it out, and pass it on. Today we're beginning a new series dealing with some of the difficult questions about God, the Bible, Jesus Christ. So here's what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. Today we're talking about how do I know the Bible is true. Next week we'll deal with the subject of disappointment with God. And then on October 18th, we'll talk about what if I hate organized religion? Because there are a lot of people who have issues because of experiences they've had with church or with church people. And so we're going to talk about that. And then the last week in the series, I need a miracle. So that's where we're going. But today we're going to talk about the Bible. How do I know the Bible is true? Now some of you who've grown up with the Bible all your life, or maybe you've recently uh, gotten into the best-selling book in the world, you know its inherent power. But for some of you, you've got real doubts about the veracity of the Bible. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, when looking at ancient documents, historians apply various tests to ancient documents to determine their reliability. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of those tests and apply them to the New Testament, internal, external, and biographical. So does the Bible pass the same tests that historians use to determine the truthfulness of other ancient documents. This is important because the Christian life is not a code of ethics or a philosophy. The Christian life 
is Christianity is the message of the gospel of a person, Jesus Christ, and that person is wrapped up in history. And so in this book, we read the historical truth about Jesus Christ himself. We don't follow a system of teachings. We follow a person. And this book is the story of that person. So let's look together in your bear notes. And um, at the beginning is 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. Here Paul is writing to one of the churches that he planted. And here's what he says. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. The messenger is human, but the word, the message is inspired by God. Now let's look at several questions. Number one, how reliable are the dates, places, and times mentioned in the New Testament? I thought it'd be good just to start with some archaeological evidence here and look at some of the places and the uh, people of the New Testament, names that are mentioned, and what kind of uh, evidence do we have that those people truly existed in the times that they existed. So let's just jump in and look at a few of these. The first one is Licinius um, of Abilene. It's in Luke 3.1. Now, when Paul... When, when Luke uh, announces Jesus' public ministry, he says that it's during the time of Licinius, Tetrarch of Abilene. Well, for a long time, scholars questioned Luke's veracity because the only Licinius that anyone had ever heard of was a guy who was a ruler of Calchas who ruled about 40 years before Jesus' birth. And so, obviously, that couldn't be the same person. And so, finally, they discovered an inscription dating to the time of Tiberius, and Tiberius ruled from the, the ruler of the Roman Empire from 14 to 37. So Tiberius was the ruler during the time of Jesus' adult life. And um, he, they found this temple uh, dedication, which, was, which names Lysanias as the Tetrarch of Abila near Damascus, which is exactly what Luke had said. Okay, in Acts 18, Paul was brought before Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia. Once again, archaeology... Um, found at Delphi an inscription of a letter from Emperor Galli, uh, Claudius. And it was discovered, and it said, Lucius Junio Gallus, my friend and the proconsul of Achaia. Historians date the inscription to 52 A.D., and uh, Paul was in that city in 51 A.D., so it matches well the time that Paul was there. Okay, here's another. Erastus, maybe some of you remember Erastus in the New Testament. He, he's found in two places, in Acts 19 and Romans 6, 16. He was a co-worker of Paul, and he was, he was called the Corinthian uh, city treasurer. Well, archaeologists excavating a Corinthian theater uh, in the last century discovered an inscription, and it says, Erastus, in return for his adulship, laid the pavement at his own expense. So Erastus... Uh, paid for this uh, pavement, like a street, I guess. He paid for it. And the pavement, they know, was laid in A.D. 50, exactly the time that Paul was there. <clears throat> the designation of treasurer um, is uh, pretty much what this adelship uh, refers to. Okay, here's another one. Publius, Acts 28. Remember that Paul was shipwrecked one time, and he ended up swimming over to the island of Malta. And it says that there was a guy, Publius, who was the first man of the island, which is kind of a weird phrase, first man. It's, it said the proto-man, you know, like prototype. And nobody had ever seen this description of a, of a leader called the first man. But uh, anyway, they came across a, an inscription uh, more recently that said that uh, the leader of Malta was called the first man. So that was a, the phrase that they used in Malta, maybe nowhere else in the Greek-speaking world, but in Malta they called the leader the first man. Then there's, of course, Pilate. Now, Pontius Pilate, um, he's one of the critical figures in the New Testament, right? I mean, for a long time, there was no historical evidence that there ever was a Pontius Pilate. Not until 1961 did they finally discover something that had Pontius Pilate's name on it. And it was a stone. Uh, it was a, a stone that they found that had Tiberius, uh, the, the emperor at the time, and then underneath it said um, uh, Pontius Pilate. It was at uh, Caesarea by the Sea. We were there just a few months ago at Caesarea by the Sea in the, in the amphitheater. There, this stone was found that apparently related uh, something to the city there. 
There was also at Herodium, we saw this as well, there is a ring that was found that had Pilate's name on it. Now, it probably was not Pilate's ring, but since he was the governor of that area, maybe he had rings made for his staff or something like that, and they all wore the, wore the Pilate ring. So anyway, they found this Pilate ring, so we got to see that as well. So anyway, for, for centuries, critics have been saying the New Testament can't be true because there is no Pontius Pilate ever known in history. Finally, in 1961 and forward, they found these two inscriptions that said Pilate and uh, finally showed the Bible, the New Testament, to be true. Now, Luke, who wrote Luke and Acts, he named 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine islands, and every one of them have been found to be the exact representation for that particular era. And that's important because um, nations, you know, countries change their names and cities change their names. Like... Just a few years ago, there was a country called Yugoslavia. But now, today, it's called Serbia, Macedonia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Croatia, Slovenia, Montenegro, and Kosovo. Just every century, all these, there's all these place names that change. And so Luke identified all the places at the time that they were supposed to be there. So, that's number one. How reliable are dates and places? Very reliable. Number two, who decided which books would be in the New Testament? That's a good question. The Old Testament is easy because Jesus decided which books should be in the Old Testament. So that's easy for us. There, the books of the Old Testament were divided into three categories. The law, the prophets, and the writings. The Sadducees only believed in the law. The Pharisees believed in the law, the prophets, and the writings. Jesus said we should we should read the law, the prophets, and the writings. So he decided for us that against the Sadducees, for the Pharisees, that all three of the writings were indeed the word of God. So that's easy. But the New Testament is a collection of letters, collection of gospels, stories about Jesus, all this kind of stuff. How do you decide? Well, here's some criteria. Number one, an eyewitness of Jesus. There had to be an eyewitness of Jesus. There had to be an eyewitness testimony of Jesus himself, not something written down uh, centuries later. Let me just read uh, the beginning of Luke. Um, so in Luke chapter 1, here's what Luke wrote to tell how he had, had prepared to write the book of Luke. He didn't just throw it together. He's t talking about his research here. He said, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word have handed them down to us, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. He's, in other words, Theophilus was some wealthy person who asked Paul, he, he contracted with Paul to write all this down, so that you might know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. And so, eyewitnesses. Number two, spiritual power. When you read the New Testament, you recognize right away, if you're a believer, you recognize right away the spiritual power of it. It changes your life. It changes your heart. It lifts you up. You, you recognize that. And there were a lot of other documents at the time, and, and later on over the next uh, three or four centuries, but when you read them, they, they do not have spiritual power. Okay, this is... In, in the Nagamati um, discoveries of 1945, they discovered another gospel, the gospel of, of Thomas. And here's a copy of it. I got it because I wanted to know exactly what this, this new discovery was, you know. And uh, actually, it's not really a gospel. It is a, it's a group of sayings. It's kind of like the Proverbs, you know. It's like each, each little saying is on a different subject. So it's, it's like a hundred and something um, sayings of Je supposedly sayings of Jesus. And since they're so, sort of cryptic and sort of simple, some scholars were saying, well, maybe this is the real one. And then other people just expanded on it and just made up stuff to add to it. But when you read it, that's not, that's not it at all. I mean, this is, um, this is so far substandard compared to the New Testament. It's not even funny. Uh, let me read the beginning of it here. Let's see. Where does it start? Here we go. So here's where it starts. It says, these are the secret words. Now, that ought to be a clue right there. <laughs> These are the secret words of Jesus. Nobody knows them except for me. These are the secret words of the living Jesus spoke, uh, that he spoke, and Didymus, 
Judas Thomas wrote down, and he who discovers the interpretation of these words will not taste death. That's how it starts. And it tells you right away. This is some cult group, you know, that came up with a bunch of stuff. And this is like some of their secret mumbo jumbo that they put together. Now, let me just read a couple of things and you'll get the idea right away of this. Okay, here we go. Jesus said, where there are three gods, gods they are. And where there are two or one, I am with him. Okay, that's kind of a typical statement in this. Here's another one. Jesus said, if they ask you, what is your source? Answer them, we have come from the light and the place where the light came to be of itself. It came to be and it revealed itself in their image. If they ask you, who are you? Answer, we are his sons. We are the chosen of the living father. Now, who's this they? The they are the archons. This, is, this was a Gnostic group, a, a cult group, and they had these people, <laughs> these things called archons, which were the rulers of seven planets. And that's what they're saying. If the rulers of the seven planets ask you, tell them that you are from the light. Now, does this sound, does this sound like it's um, spiritual power to you? It, it sounds like a typical cult group. If you've studied Scientology, it kind of has the idea of Scientology. It's just a, a bunch of made-up mumbo-jumbo that, uh, you know, maybe some people find helpful. But the emphasis is, is that it's secret material. And if you know the secrets, then you can advance to a higher level on a spiritual plane. Well, the, the Bible is the exact opposite of that. It's not secret material. It's for everybody. And so right away we realize that uh, it's not working. Okay, inherent value. Number three, inherent value. That is, it speaks to the soul. Um, and that's why we have uh, Bible study groups. That's why we have groups here. Because it has inherent value, so let's study it together and work on it and learn it together. Uh, this week is the week that we begin new groups here, and I hope you'll sign up for one out there. We're going to have a group that meets here in the auditorium. If you want to join, I'll be leading this group. And we'll watch the video. We have a great video on the screen, and then we'll discuss it together. So I uh, invite you to do that, or you can do it online, or you can start your own group. And we have the books out there, and the videos are all online, so you can, uh, you can uh, uh, um, uh, watch those yourself. Number four, universal acceptance. Universal acceptance. So the New Testament documents were just universally accepted. I mean, it's the, it's the coolest thing. There was no council or whatever that got together and decided, well, these are going to be the official 27 books. We're throwing out these others out and keeping these. And that didn't happen that way. Here's the way it happened. Different groups just collected documents. Y you think like in A.D. 50, half of, the doc half of the New Testament wasn't even written yet. But they were, whatever was written, they began collecting those. And then by 60 and 70, they were collecting those. The last book of the New Testament was written, was probably written about 95 by the Apostle John. He died about 95 or 100, so it was written right at the end of his life. So that would be the last one. And so they were, they were collecting these and uh, passing them around from church to church, and everybody's making their own copies. And so over time, they just developed the ones that everybody thought, well, these are for real. These really work. These clearly have uh, spiritual power. And so in 367, Athanasius wrote a letter every year, every Easter, he wrote a letter to all the churches. He was the, he was the bishop at Rome. And so he wrote a letter to all the churches. And in that letter, he just happens to mention, oh, by the way, these are the 27 books that everybody accepts. And those are the 27 books that we have. There was no council that decided that. It's just that every church on their own came up with the same 27. And so there you go. It was a miracle. Let's look on the next page. Number three, are there any missing books from the New Testament? Maybe that's not the w right way to ask that question. Maybe we should say, did Paul write some other letters that we don't have? And the answer is yes. He did write some letters that we don't have. And I've got them mentioned here in these verses. In 1 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10, Paul said, I wrote to you in my letter. Now, this is 1 Corinthians. And he's saying, I wrote to you in my letter. So there was another letter of pre-1 Corinthians. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers and idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world. So there was a pre-1 Corinthians. And then he said in, his, in the second letter to Corinthians, he said, For I wrote to you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. Okay, what letter is that? It, it's called in theological work the severe letter 
but we don't have the severe letter. First Corinthians is not a severe letter. What he's talking about there is not seen anywhere in First Corinthians. So there was a pre-First Corinthians. Then he wrote First Corinthians. We have that. Then he wrote another letter. We don't the severe letter. We don't have that. And then we have Second Corinthians. And then here's one more. In Colossians four, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read to the church from the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. We don't have that one either. So. Who knows, Paul may have written hundreds of letters, but the ones that we have are the ones that we were supposed to have. We, there are three specifically mentioned. Now, churches and individuals started collecting these letters, and they made copies. Now, let, let me just say, if I were there, and I was in the church of, uh, I was at the church at Colossae, and they said, uh, we've got this letter, I would say, could I borrow that letter? I'd like to make my own copy, right? Wouldn't you do the same thing? We'd all do that, right? Everybody wants their own copy of these letters, and so they were copied, but you know, sometimes you say, well, they were hastily copied. Well, I'll tell you, if I had a letter from the Apostle Paul, I would not be, I would not hastily copy it. I would be very careful in copying. And so I think the, the people were pretty careful in it because this is the, they knew it's the Word of God. And so they wanted to have the Word of God in their own home. There's an interesting thing. One of the books in the New Testament is Philemon. It's just a little short letter, and it's a weird subject matter because Paul is writing to Philemon, asking him to accept back his slave. Okay, so, like, what's that about? Well, anyway, why would this be in the New Testament? Well, could it be that Philemon was a collector? Maybe he was some wealthy guy that had this big library, and he collected all the letters. And so it might have been that, the, the, that uh, one of, in that particular area, that he was the primary collector of things about the New Testament, and so he's, what we have is, in essence, um, Philemon's library that was passed down to the church and uh, passed down on to us. Number four, was the New Testament written down only in oral tradition form for centuries before being written down? Now, when I was at the university years ago, there were a lot of people that said, you know, the New Testament, it was just an oral tradition. They just passed it down verbally, and it probably wasn't written down to about two or three, four hundred A.D. Well, that is ridiculous. These are Paul's letters, right? They're letters. You don't tell a letter, you write down a letter. These were educated people. They all, Paul was one of the most educated people of his day. He was like a Harvard graduate of his day. Of course he knew how to write, and he wrote everything down, and he had actually... It, it, when he wrote letters, actually he had other people, he was usually dictating and other people were writing it down for him. They may have actually collaborated on things. He said, they, you know, they might have said, Paul, you, are you sure you want to say it that way? Maybe this would be a better word. He's like, okay, let's use that word. And so uh, these were carefully written documents. They were all written down. They weren't carried around in, in uh, oral tradition. In Second Peter 3, 15 to 16, so this is Peter writing, all right? So this is probably 60-something A.D., because he died uh, 67 or so. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking of them in these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. That's right, isn't it? <laughs> Paul wrote some things hard to understand. Okay. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant, unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. He's saying, even by 60-something A.D., they're already considering Paul's letters to be the Scriptures. And so um, th it, this wasn't something from 400 A.D. That, was, that somebody just wrote down from memory. These are actual letters that we have. So let me just mention kind of um, a trail of how leaders came down through the ages. One is Clement of Rome. Okay, I have here, um, this is the... Book one of the Ananasine Fathers. There are ten of these. So I have, I have these ten. All the Ananasine Fathers. These are written down in teeny weeny little print. All the documents from the early ages up to about the fourth century. So all the documents that anybody knows about up to the fourth century are in the Ananasine Fathers. The very first one is, is the first epistle of Clement. It was written in 100. Clement is mentioned in the New Testament. He became the pastor in Rome. And so he, he wrote this letter. It's a long letter, um, it longer than most New Testament books. And um, according to my evaluation, he has 46 New Testament references in here, which, which is quoted from 14 different New Testament books. So by 100, 
while people are still finding letters, copying letters, passing letters around, by, by 100 A.D., he's already quoting from 14 different letters or uh, books of the New Testament um, very early. That's, so that's very early. We're not talking about 400. We're talking about the time when Apostle John was still alive. Um, so the Apostle John died in about 100. Polycarp was a disciple of Apostle John. He died in 155, or he was martyred in 155. When he was finally caught, he was a great teacher. He was carrying on the tradition, especially of, of the Apostle John's teaching. Um, when he was caught and arrested, he said, they said, you must denounce Jesus Christ and honor only Caesar. And this is his response. 86 years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And it is said they were about to nail him to a post, so that a uh, stake, when they burned him at the stake. And he said, you don't need to nail me to the stake. I'll be, I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I will gladly die for my Savior. And he was burned at the stake. So he was a great teacher. And it was carrying on, especially uh, from his mentor, the Apostle John. Irenaeus then was a disciple of Polycarp, <clears throat> and who died in 200. Irenaeus was born in Turkey. But he was a missionary to France. Isn't that interesting that even in that early period of, of the Christian world, uh, here's a guy from Turkey who goes as a missionary already all the way over to France. Of course, Thomas uh, went all the way to India. Some people went all the way to England. And so people were traveling all over the Roman world and the East at the time. And uh, Irenaeus, uh, one of the great early theologians of the church, he wrote about nearly every single one of the 27 books of the New Testament. And so he, he was just the disciple of a disciple of the Apostle John himself. So it's not like this was, you know, like 300 years later, people are like, oh, there was some guy named Jesus. Let's write up some stuff about him. Let's make up some stuff. Uh, that's ridiculous. Okay, number five. Now, this is an interesting one. Why is it that sometimes in the Old Testament quotations have different wording in the New Testament? Okay. Maybe, I don't know if you've noticed this before, but you get in some books like Matthew has a lot of quotations from the Old Testament. He, the Hebrews have a lot of quotations from the Old Testament. Sometimes, it, I don't know if you've done this or not, but if you look at that quotation and you go back in the Old Testament and look it up, it's, the wording is different. And you're like, well, if it's a quote, why, is, why are not the words the same? And it, this is an English translation, and you're thinking, well, English translators, they could go back, they could make the words the same. So why are they not the same? Well, here's the reason why. This is a book called the Septuagint. It is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. I uh, found this in a bookstore in, um, at Duke Divinity School, and I bought it. I'd always wanted one. It has the Greek on one side and the English on the other side. So here's what happened. A couple hundred years before Jesus, scholars said that uh, Greek was, taken over, was the language of the people because of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, the Greek, he uh, conquered the whole known world just about. And he made Greek the language of trade everywhere. So everybody was speaking Greek. The Hebrew Bible's written in Hebrew. And so a lot of Greek scholars said, you know what, we need to translate this into Greek because most people don't speak Hebrew, they only speak Greek. So they translated the Old Testament into Greek. Now here's what's interesting. Many of the New Testament writers use this as their Bible, not the Hebrew text. Because they, they were more familiar with Greek than they were with Hebrew, and so they used the Greek text. So when you read in the New Testament, um, usually when you're reading those quotes, it, which, which is written in Greek, and the whole New Testament's written in Greek, and so they're reading these Greek quotes, but they're taking it from the Greek Bible, which is a translation from the Hebrew into Greek. You, see, you, get, you with me here? And so here's just a simple example. Isaiah 40, all people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. But when that's quoted in 1 Peter, it says all people are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. Well, you know, that's just one word, but these words, those are completely different words. And so in the first one, that's the original Hebrew translated into English, the word faithfulness. But Peter was reading it from the Greek translation, and so he used the Greek translation, so it translated from Hebrew into Greek, and then into English, and the words end up being a little bit different. So I've always found that to be fascinating. I hope it was for you too. Okay, let's look at number six. Did errors creep into the copying as manuscripts were copied by hand through the centuries? Well, of course some errors crept in. 
How, how are you going to have uh, thousands of copies and done by human beings and nobody make any typos? Obviously, there are going to be some typos in there. Now, the earliest manuscripts were made of papyrus. Papyrus uh, is from Egypt, and uh, along the Nile there, they grow these uh, reeds. They look kind of like cattails. We have cattails in this area. Okay, so you take a cattail and cut the top off and cut the bottom off, and you've got a stem, right? Okay, then you can slice it down, and you can peel off that stem like an onion. And so you peel it off, and you've got a, a long strip. So then they take those strips, peel them all off, and then they put them in water and soak them, and they get a little bit fatter when they soak up with all the water. And then once they get a little thicker, they take them and lace them together. So you put one this way, one this way, and then one this way and that way, and then, you know, lace them in and out like you're making one of those little pot holders like we did as kids. Okay, so you go in and out, and you make this deal, and you, and you end up with a sheet about this size, and then you put a big press on top of it and press it down like with a 1,000 pounds and leave it there for a week until it dries. When it dries, you pull that off, and you've got a piece of paper. I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty much just like that. And you can write on it, and it's easy to write on. But here's the problem with papyrus. All the New Testament was written on papyrus. The problem is that it uh, disintegrates over time. Just, you know, kind of like paper does. And so you, you, they discover a copy sometimes, but we have some that, that made it. But so like the Nag Hammadi in 1945, you, you pick up one of those things and it might just crumble in your hands, you know. And so uh, they have to be really careful. They take pictures of it first to make sure they don't destroy the word uh, if they, they have something. But there are some papyrus. However, what really lasts is parchment. Parchment is leather. Leather lasts forever. And so writing on leather works great. And so you got these two different sources of ancient manuscripts. Some are papyrus, which most of them disintegrated, and some are or parchment, which, which worked out just fine. But most parchment didn't even show up till a couple of hundred years later. Now, Many writers have attempted to discredit the New Testament due to all the variants between the different ancient manuscripts. Uh, one person identified that there are at least 200,000 variants. In other words, a variant would be one person spells a word this way and one person spells a word a different way. That's a variant. There are at least 200,000 variants among all the documents that we have of handwritten manuscripts of the New Testament. Well, is that a problem? Well, let me just mention what some of those variants are like. John, who shows up a lot in the New Testament, right? John sometimes is spelled with, with one N and sometimes spelled with two Ns. Well, those are variants. Well, there's like 15,000 variants just of that one, one N or two Ns. Okay, so of those 200,000 variants, 15,000 of them are just the word John. Then, in Greek, a lot of times they put the word the in front of a name. So they would say, the Mary said this, you know. You know, we don't say it that way. We just drop the V. Well, sometimes they drop the V because people don't exactly say it that way. It's just like a, it's just a, like a placeholder. Well, there's another 20,000 variants that are just that V, you know, just whether or not you put the V or leave out the V. But you know what's kind of cool about these variants is that if you find John spelled with two N's, you know that that's a, a trace. Or if you find a misspelled word and it keeps showing up in different documents, you know that that, that's how you can trace that document back because you got that same misspelled word. It's in this document, this one, this one, but it's not in all these. So you can trace those back and say, well, all these came from the same line. Somebody back there misspelled that name and it just got copied over a uh, hundred times, you know, all down through the years. So that's actually kind of good that you can see those variants and you can trace it back to the, uh, to the original or as close to the original as possible. Um, the, sometimes they would substitute, like, Instead of using the word na Jesus, sometimes they would substitute the Lord. Well, there's like thousands and thousands of those. In fact, of all those 200,000 variants, 99% of them are just stuff like that, just like a, a misspelled word. 1%, no, none of the variants in the 1% hold any theological significance. And so when, when, you know, there's a writer who always says, with these 200,000 variants, how can you trust that you know anything about what Jesus said because there are all these variants. Well, all the variants are just silly little things like John with one end or John with two ends. Um, to, to tell you the truth, it's a surprise that there's only 200,000. I would think there'd be millions. 
because we have so many manuscripts. And these manuscripts were developed in different places. There was kind of like the Alexandrian school of copyists. There was the Antioch school of copyists. There was the Rome school of copyists. And all of them, though, sometimes though, uh, you know, one little mistake or one typo would get copied over and over in their tradition. So they can kind of trace it back to the different areas, which I think is nice. Okay, number seven. How do the New Testament manuscripts stack up against ancient manuscripts? Now, what we've been looking at is some of the internal and external evidence for the New Testament. This is called the bibliographical evidence for the New Testament. How do you deal with ancient manuscripts? So, if you want to take other ancient manuscripts, how does that compare to the New Testament? In other words, do, with all the ancient manuscripts we have from the Roman Empire, <clears throat> does the New Testament stack up well against it? Well, let me just show you. For example... Caesar, all right, Caesar's Gallic Wars. One of the, the, the day one of Latin class, <laughs> I remember back in high school, all Gaul is divided into three parts. That's how the book started. Okay, that was written about 50 AD, so right before Jesus. There are 10 handwritten copies of Caesar's Gallic Wars, the earliest of which is dated 900 AD. So there's only 10 handwritten copies of Caesar's Gallic Wars. And even though it was almost a thousand years between the time it was written and the oldest copy. So it had been copied over and over for a thousand years, and the earliest copy is 900. Okay, Tacitus. It was written about 100 AD. There are 20 handwritten copies, and the earliest of that is 900. So for 800 years, Tacitus was copies were made, copies, 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 and then there are 20 copies that have been found, the earliest of which is AD 900. The New Testament was written between A.D. 40 and 100. The earliest papyrus fragment is dated 125, just 25 years after the Apostle John died. And there are 24,000 early handwritten copies or portions of the New Testament. How does the New Testament compare to other documents? There's, there's no comparison. There's no comparison. The New Testament has such a firm basis in manuscript evidence compared to every other uh, ancient manuscript there is. There is no ancient manuscript that even halfway compares to the New Testament documents. Um, so even though there's a bit of a leap of faith, we, what we discover is that the veracity of the New Testament is far above any other ancient manuscript. Now, what is faith? Mark Twain said, faith is believing something you know ain't true. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's not faith, all right? <laughs> faith is to trust in a person or a truth's claim based on evidence, but it's not, that's not completely provable, right? You can't have 100% scientific proof about anything that relates to values and, and, and truth claims, right? And so there's a leap of faith. But here's what I would say, that Faith in Jesus Christ is the shortest leap. It's a leap of faith. But of all the other options, it's the shortest leap we've got. Carl Sagan, the atheist, said, The cosmos is all there is or was or ever will be. Now, what kind of leap of faith do you have to make to make that statement? <laughs> is he sure? Does he have scientific proof that there is nothing else out there? Does he have scientific proof that there is no God? Does he have scientific proof that we cannot pray? I mean, he doesn't have scientific proof of any of that. This is like the biggest leap of faith ever. Have you heard of the multiverse? There are suggestions that there may be other co cosmos out there. There's millions of them, you know. What kind of leap of faith does it, say, does it take to say, only that which I can see is true? If I can't see it, it's not true, and I know that 100%. You know, that's a, what a huge leap of faith. But for Jesus Christ, the shortest leap is the leap of faith to believe in him. In um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, here's what it says about the Bible. All scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. I believe that the Christian faith is the shortest leap because this book tells us what reality really is. I found that to be true, and I hope you found that to be true as well. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for giving us the word. 
we recognize, Lord, that without the word, we would be, um, we'd be struggling in darkness. But instead, you have, you have shown yourself to us. You have opened our eyes to be able to see who you are. And my prayer is, Lord, that each one of us would treasure our copies of your word and imprint them on our hearts that we might live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey again, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to let you know about a couple of things before we go. First of all, our life groups for the fall are starting this week. Uh, we're doing a great study from Andy Stanley called Starting Over. Whether it's your career, your marriage, or another major global event like, say, a pandemic, a major life event, uh, we all have opportunities and we all have times in our lives when things kind of fall apart and when we have to start over. So we're going to take four weeks in our life groups and go through this series and learn how can we start over when life kind of falls apart. We have groups that are going to be meeting in person and others that are meeting online. You can sign up out in the commons if you're here with us in person, or you can email julia at bearvalleychurch.com to help get connected to a group. We hope you'll find a life group for these next four weeks in October and go through this great study together. Also, uh, we are going to be having a drive through fall carnival on Halloween Day. That's Saturday, October 31st from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, we're going to have an event, kind of an alternative to trick-or-treating, since trick-or-treating uh, may not be happening this year for a lot of people. Uh, an opportunity for our preschool and elementary families and for your neighbors to drive through our parking lot uh, to collect some candy and play some games and have a lot of fun together. You can find in your bulletin some ways that you can help with this event. Uh, that could be things like donating candy, uh, helping with uh, one of the stations that we have as part of the drive through event, and you can also help set up and clean up. You can email melissa at melissa at bearvalleychurch.com if you want to get involved or if you want to learn more. Thanks for helping with this awesome event. We know it's going to be a great time for everybody. That's all we've got for today. We hope to see you again next week, and now our worship team is going to play us out.
Our sin was heavy, the chains break at the way. 